Today's episode is brought to you by ECC Frames. After 40 years in the framing business, ECC Frames has gotten into the custom business to market their services to all geeks. Framing comic books, trading cards, movie posters, record albums, gaming cartridges, action figures, and even models with quality and durability. Whether you're talking about frames or cubes, they use fine, durable Italian wood in their framing. UV resilient acrylic and acid free black mat board around the collectible. They also have different colors in frames and mat boards and can work with you to customize the look of your frame or cube to make an artful presentation you'll be proud to present in your geek cave. ECC did a great job for me preserving my original Spider-Man comic strips. I've talked about it before, written by Stan Lee, drawn by Larry Lieber. They can do it for you at very reasonable rates. Think about it. You've probably spent hundreds or even thousands of dollars on a toy, a trading card, a comic book, or some vintage collectible. Don't you want to present and protect it from damaging sunlight and wear? Go to eccframes.com, see their work online, contact them about making a customized frame or cube for your collectible. Use the promo code WORDBALLOON for an additional savings on your order. Again, that's eccframes.com with the promo code WORDBALLOON. WORDBALLOON is also brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. Uh, as always, tremendous deals are happening at InStock Trades. Go to the website yourself. You will be surprised at the wonderful selection of books at great prices, your favorite artists, your favorite writers, your favorite characters, and favorite uh, uh, genres are represented in comic form at InStockTrades.com. Uh, don't forget, if your orders are $50 or more, you'll receive free shipping. Uh, they're my friends, and uh, they're longtime uh, sponsors of Word Balloon, and uh, they offer great books at great prices. Check it out for yourself, InStockTrades.com. And now, on to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Before we get to our main feature today, which is uh, a great panel that happened just last weekend at uh, FanX in Salt Lake City, Marv Wolfman, uh, a great spotlight panel. We, we touch on a lot of his career and a lot of interesting topics but uh, felt at the top of the show we had to acknowledge the passing of Bernie Wrightson. Uh, Bernie was an incredible Bronze Age creator. We all know he was the co-creator with Len Wein of Swamp Thing. But really, when you think about it, Bernie ushered in a style of horror that had never been seen uh, in the likes of comics. Such an original style. Incredible detail. What what an incredible creative mind. And, and to lose him... Uh, to brain cancer was just heartbreaking. I never had the opportunity to have Bernie on Word Balloon, but uh, through my acquaintanceship with guys like Tim Bradstreet, who I've known since college, and uh, Steve Niles, I was introduced to Bernie on several uh, convention occasions, got to talk to him briefly. Sweet gentleman. We had agreed in principle to get to, uh, to do a, an eventual interview, but... Um, my first opportunity, which I thought would happen, would be at that first Cincy Comic Con because we were both invited, and uh, the organizer said, "Hey, you know, you're going to do a spotlight with Bernie." Well, Bernie got sick, and it turned out, uh, I believe, the sickness uh, was the initial stages of the discovery that uh, he, he uh, you know, was starting to suffer from brain cancer. I, I don't know where his cancer began, and if I, that presumption is wrong on my part, I apologize. But it just seemed like Bernie was chronically sick after that, and that was several years ago. So uh, my feeling was I, I want to wait until I knew that uh, Bernie was, re you know, recovering because I knew he was, you know, getting getting in his early senior years, and I didn't want to, you know, upset him or, you know, obviously catch him at a time when when he was hurting. And unfortunately, um, recovery never happened, and we we lost him this weekend. Um, I did, however, early on in my first interview with Steve Niles had the opportunity to talk to him about his uh, collaborations with Bernie, which started in uh, 2008, I want to say, and uh, continued until, you know, Bernie couldn't draw anymore. Uh, it's, it's a great story, and I uh, wanted to share it with you now. Uh, Steve Niles talking about his uh, first collaboration with uh, Bernie Wrightson and what was to come. Here it is now on Word Balloon. To me, it's like, yeah, that's a dream come true, because I have loved Wrightson since I was a little kid. You know, but to have him realize the same thing, you know, that he and I should work together, just one of them, just 
what is it? It's just amazing. Did you approach him? This is for City of Others. I didn't say a word. I was so happy to just ha know him as a friend. And if you hang around him or any really unbelievably talented artist, they get hit up constantly for work. And I just decided on meeting him, I was like, you know, we had so, we knew he, we had, we were coming from such a similar place as as our love of horror and what you know ha, what we love and why we love it. I just made like a very conscious decision. I was, I'm not going to hit him up for work. I'm not going to be one of these. You know, I'm not going to be another person who hits him up. And then we go out and we're uh, having we go to this place called the Concrete Beach where you can get oysters and beer and we're hanging out and. We actually started doing, we started like writing this, uh, just verbally jamming on this uh, hard-boiled detective story. So I went home and wrote up some of the text and sent it to him, and he really liked it. And a few, uh, few weeks later, he sat me down, and he, and he literally did this, like, he's like, listen, I, wanna, I think I want to do comics again, and I want to do them with you. And I just, I'm pretty sure my heart stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, what, who, who, wait, you know, <laughs> Did you just say what I think you just said? And then, you know, we initially set it up at uh, D.C., and um, they wound up, I think, honestly, once they really saw what we were talking about, because we really wanted no holds barred. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they they were like, eh, maybe, you know, maybe we'll, cause, you know, I, obviously I love D.C., and I'm doing a lot of other stuff with them, yes. so there's no problem. So we wound up going to Dark Horse with it, and uh, me and Bernie just started jamming on ideas. And it just came together. And it's just been, it is an absolute pleasure working with him. That's fantastic. Beyond this arc, do you see yourself working more with him? If uh... We could keep going for, I mean, at this point, we have about two years planned out. That's fantastic. literally go for, I mean, it's, it's, it's up to the fans at this point. It's up to the fans and the publishers. Bernie and Steve's collaborations continued with Dead She Said, Doc Macabre, The Ghoul, we got to see uh, Frankenstein Alive Alive in uh, 2012. Tremendous body of work. Of course, his excellent work in uh, film design as well. Uh, there's a wonderful obituary at uh, the Comics Journal, of course, at the Comics Journal, uh, that really details a lot of Bernie's career. And there have been wonderful tributes online the last few days. And uh, really felt uh, the need uh, to uh, pay my respects to one of the true masters of comics, Bernie Wrightson. Okay, so moving on, uh, we're going to have a great conversation with uh, Marv Wolfman. It's been 11 years since my last uh, on-air conversation with Marv. Really happy to say that uh, I, I got a chance to talk to him briefly uh, last San Diego at a Writers Guild uh, after hours and a uh, real friendly conversation. And I did ask him then, and I said, you know, Marv, you, I, I'm sure you don't remember, but you were on 11 years ago. I'd love to have you back because I've always been a Marv Wolfman fan. I've, I've been kind of... Uh, Honest and said, I'm not. Uh, I'm, uh, if there was a difficult interview that I've had in doing uh, my uh, interviews, Marv was kind of on that list. And uh, I just felt like, you know, podcasting might have been so new, and maybe he was expecting a 10 minute interview. Uh, it's, it's a lesson that I took to heart and uh, now prepare a potential guest to say, I hope it's okay if we talk for, you know, a half hour, 40 minutes. And usually around that time, if it's a new person, I say, you know, am I am I taxing you too much? Do you want to wrap up? I, I only have a few more things to try and get to, you know, at least an hour conversation. Guys like Bendis, screw him, man. Four hours. If it's less than that, then I, he owes me an apology. But uh, <laughs> the, the cool thing was uh, Marv said, you know, I don't know if I'm really built for podcasts. And I said, okay, and I respected that. Then this opportunity came up at uh, FanX to, uh, to do uh, this uh, interview, Spotlight Live. With Marv, and I knew he'd be fine because he's done, you know, Jesus, hundreds, if not, well, I'm, I'm going to say hundreds because in a 40 year career and, and only so many conventions a year and stuff like that, probably hundreds of uh, convention panels. So he knows what to expect. And uh, he was, uh, you know, really happy to share. And uh, it's a good time for Marv Wolfman right now. God, Judas Contract, the uh, DC animated movie based on his uh, wonderful Teen Titans story, is uh, coming out in uh, just a, a really a handful of days. And, um, you know, uh, so a lot of his characters are uh, living well on the CW, whether it's, uh, you know, certainly Deathstroke and uh, the Vigilante, uh, the, the modern Vigilante. Um, you know, just to name a few, of course, 
uh, the cartoon uh, Teen Titans uh, Go is uh, is a huge hit, and um, yeah, so it's it's uh, fun to take a little victory lap with uh, Marv Wolfman in, in front of an audience. I'm uh, I'm a big believer in trying to encourage the audience to ask questions at panels. So uh, I get a few in as uh, people are asking questions. But, you know, we're all here for the fans at conventions, especially uh, people that are invited as guests and panelists and stuff. The obligation is to provide them with that direct entertainment. So it was nice to give uh, fans that chance to to ask Marv questions directly. And uh, interesting insight and also some uh, funny moments as well. As I uh, represent this convention panel from Fanex in Salt Lake City, this spotlight on Marv Wolfman, now on Word Balloon. Hi, everybody. As uh, some few stragglers are walking in, welcome to the Marv Wolfman Spotlight Panel. My name is John Centris. I host a podcast called Word Balloon, where I get the opportunity to talk to legendary creators like our guest today. Um, I really hope everyone has uh, some questions, because I was just saying this before the mics were turned down. Please, I encourage you, start lining up now if you've got questions, because the man has written so many wonderful things from the creation of Blade, Tim Drake, Cyborg, Starfire, Raven, updating the Teen Titans and making them the amazing team that they are, not to mention his incredible work on, at Marvel on uh, Spider-Man and uh, fan, one, of my, one of my favorite runs of the Fantastic Four. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have an hour to uh, speak with Marv Wolfman, everybody. Behind What's behind you? I, an applause sign? Yes, I hope. No, no. No, no. no well earned. No, I need one. No. That's right. Um, Marvin, am I right? Is Wikipedia correct in that? Uh, Wikipedia is never correct about anything. <laughs> all right. It's all right. That's excellent. The fact that anybody can go in there, they could, you know. Rewrite. Could rewrite anything. All right. But, so you didn't, uh, you didn't write that extra. The, what's I, no, you're, the actual subject cannot correct things. Seriously, I've tried to correct some stuff. So, um, Well, yeah. we'll see if this story is apocryphal yeah. or not. Yeah. Are you the one that was responsible for getting writer credits at DC Comics for the first time, way back in, in the 70s? In sort of a way. Uh, the, uh, there, were no, uh, there, were, there were credits on some of the superhero books, but never on the mystery comics, the horror comics, whatever you want to call them. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Obviously, the people who say they can, but uh, is anyone not hearing? <laughs> okay. Uh, if they can't hear me, they can't raise their hand. Uh, anyway, uh, the they this was right before uh, the comics code change and werewolves and monsters and Draculas and things like that could not be used, uh, but. Each of the mystery stories had a host character, and the host character, just before a story I wrote, written by Jerry Conway, uh, the host character line, said the following story is to was told to me by a wandering wolfman as a joke, <laughs> because he knew I wrote the next one, and the comics code rejected it because wolfmans were not allowed at that particular point, and they, so the company said, that's his, actually his name. <laughs> And they said, in which case, you're going to have to put a credit on it. I have that page at home. It's on my wall. And you can see my name has been pasted onto the artwork. <laughs> and of course, once my name was on it, all the writers wanted their name on it, too. So uh, you know, if my name was Joe Smith, we'd still be working in a total obscurity. You know. Now, you were really involved both editorially and writing a lot of black and white comics. And, and I know on the Marvel side as well, it's great magazines. Um, was there a different uh, tone to those from an adult standpoint than uh, the, you know what was on the spinner rack? Well, uh, I was at uh, I worked at Warren magazines too, and I was the editor of Creepy Eerie and Vampirella, which is why Marvel hired me to handle the black and white magazines at Marvel. They were obviously uh, more intense. Uh, you can get away with a lot more stuff that actually helped you write horror material. Um, uh, the DC books were not considered horror comics. They were considered mystery comics. And, of course, they weren't that. They were sort of shock stories uh, with surprise endings, which you can guess by page two. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 
the, the black and whites allowed for a little bit more intensity. And of course, by within a year or two, uh, we were able to uh, uh, have all the monsters, all the classic monsters like Dracula and, Vamp and uh, uh, the werewolf and uh, things like that, Frankenstein and all of that stuff. So uh, it forced the comics code to change. You know, Tomb of Dracula, your wonderful run at Marvel, was it really did seem to be different, not only because it wasn't per se a superhero book, but you know, it just I don't know, it it had it, it felt more realistic maybe because of Gene Colan's art in a lot of ways. Gene Colan's art was brilliant and I've always said that Gene Gene's art is what helped me learn how to be a writer because he could draw people like nobody else and he drew these incredible characters and when you're looking at it and you're writing Marvel style, uh, which is plot form uh, rather than full script, you're writing to real people. So that gets you very quickly to learn how to do it. I knew how to plot, I knew how to uh, uh, structure a story, but Gene's work sort of forced me to learn how to do characterization. So uh, he was a wonderful artist, I mean a brilliant artist, to the point that you can look at the history of comics and you'll find a million artists who copy other artists. You will never find anyone who try, even tried to copy Gene Colan because none of them were capable of doing it. Yeah, yeah he was amazing. I, I had the pleasure of talking to him a couple times before he passed away. You know, um, I, I'm going to bounce around because you've accomplished so much in, in various decades and I have to obviously acknowledge that the uh, DC animated uh, version of the Judas Contract is coming out in a couple yeah. of weeks. That is uh, one of the, the classic uh, Teen Titans stories that you created. Can we go back to the uh, your reboot of the Teen Titans? Because certainly there had been, I was reading those pre-Wolfman Perez Teen Titans series, but you certainly, you guys upped the game with, with your interpretation and your addition of new characters. Well, what happened was essentially I decided to leave Marvel and come over to DC and the, I only requested one thing, uh, which was I didn't want any team-up books. Uh, by team-up <laughs> books, I mean I was writing for two and a half years at Marvel, Marvel 2 and 1, which was The Thing and somebody else. Um, and every month it had to be a different somebody else, which made stories that I, did, uh, I just thought it didn't work. I thought the whole concept was stupid uh, for the most part. I even changed it into in one where I had continued material just to try and give it some depth. But the idea of always having to find an excuse to team up two characters seemed to me to be incredibly phony. And I did not want to do that at DC. I didn't want to do that at all. So I said, do not put me on any team up books. So immediately they put me on World's Finest and Brave and Bold, which were both <laughs> team up books. Um, so I had to work really hard to figure out how to get off of it. I quickly got off of one. I wrote at least one of both. Uh, I got off of one and got Superman, which is what I really wanted to write. And I had to come up with something uh, to get rid of uh, the other one. And I had written some Teen Titans stories back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, uh, very early on in the run, I think issue 17 or 18 of the original Teen Titans. Who was your artist on those? Huh? I'm curious who your artist was on those early uh, ones. Bill Drought okay. um, did one. Nick Cardi did another with Neil Adams. Wow. Um, and Gil Kane and I did um, the original origin of Wonder Girl to explain who she was. Uh, because as a fan, I could, you know, it drove me crazy. <laughs> that character did not exist, and yet yeah. they didn't know it. I'll get to that later. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I went, well, I wrote a bunch of Teen Titans, and they had canceled the last version of the Teen Titans about a year before. So I said, why don't I just recreate the Teen Titans and do that? And came up with the characters, uh, pitched it to uh, the DC people. They, they didn't quite understand why we wanted to because the last version of Teen Titans um, failed pretty miserably. And uh, we just said we'd do it better. Uh, ran into George, uh, who I had done an FF annual with at Marvel, asked him if he'd be interested. Um, George said fine, but he really wants to do the Justice League. 
and we arranged for him to do a fill-in or something because, uh, you know, there was a regular artist. So we started, we did the first, we decided also at that point the sales were pretty bad, and every new book died by issue six. Wow. Uh, and go back, you'll see it. Every oh, yeah. single book died by issue six. So we figured we would get six issues of Teen Titans, and then George would do Justice League, and I'd do something else. <laughs> and so because of that, we would do exactly what we always wanted to do. We wanted to do a book a certain way. It was going to die anyway, so let's finally do something the way we really want it. And we created the, uh, created the Titans to be the book that we wanted to see. And the first issue sold enormously high, as first issues do. Then each issue following kept going down until issue six, which zoomed up. The reason is, back then, there weren't comic book shops. It was all um, a newsstand. And you didn't get your sales figures for six to nine months. It took that long to get it. So they were ordering issue two without ever seeing issue one. They were ordering issue three without seeing issue one. They were ordering issue four without seeing issue one. And finally sales started to come in. And by the time issue six came out, uh, they had gotten the sales figures on issue one. And that was enormous. And uh, it just never stopped going up after that. So that's pretty much how the Titans happened. I love, too, that the book was so successful that um, your book and also Batman and the Outsiders graduated. And we, there was a newsstand version that was in the uh, uh, rag stock, the, the yeah. normal print, and then the Baxter paper yeah. versions, which really was this. And I assume for the direct market, which had sprung yeah. up in the meantime. Yeah, the, uh, the direct market... Um well, both of them were on sale at the direct market, but the newsstand only got the regular comic. Yeah, it, it, it was an experiment which pretty much failed. But really, uh, yeah, because um, there were three books out there at double the price. True. Yeah, and there was the same book. Yeah, other than the quality yeah. of the paper. That's yeah. true. What about the idea? Because I know this impacted not only my generation, but I think subsequent generations. Teen Titan fans. Okay, it looks like mostly, pretty much 99% of the room, if not the whole room. Um, what I think delighted all of us was we got to see these teen sidekicks finally become heroes on their own, and we literally grew up with them. I know I certainly felt that way. I'm sure you guys did as well. So, you know, tell me about that notion of allowing them to finally get older, which is pretty odd in comics. As a fan, I... Uh Sort of like the Teen Titans, uh, but I had a real, uh, you know, the stories would go up and down. And the older I got, the less I liked them. Um, they also introduced an adult uh, supervisor. And I'm going, you know, these guys, I, I, you know, I wasn't that much older at that particular point. Uh, these guys are 16, 17, 18, and 19. They don't need an adult supervisor, and I, I said they will never be an adult supervisor in the Titans as long as I'm running it. I hated the very concept of, uh, of that. And uh, These were capable people. They could do what they had to do on their own, and I did not want them having to deal with adults to explain themselves. That keeps them as the kid partners, and I wasn't interested in that at all, and George wasn't interested in that at all. We didn't draw them to look like little kids. George drew them to look like pre-adults, uh, you know, 18, 19 years old. Yeah, college they, year. Yeah, yeah, pure college. And um, high school for uh, change, London, that's about it. Sure. Uh, and whatever age Raven was. Um, yes. Uh, well, she was, in my mind, she was about 17. Okay. Um, at, at that particular point, graduating slowly higher. Uh, so... Yeah, it, I just want, in fact, young Mark Wade, who, and I say young Mark Wade because he was in the business about 11 minutes, uh, he was an assistant editor putting together some stuff, and he wanted to put Mr. Jupiter, who was the adult supervisor, in a who's who. And he and I fought tooth and nail on that uh, because I would not let them even mention Mr. Jupiter. That's he did not mentor. exist in my run. No adult existed in my run to tell the Titans what to do. And when the Justice League tried in one, in one of the early issues, they told them to go to hell. They yeah. couldn't care less about the Justice League. They weren't kid partners. They were capable superheroes on their own. 
Was there pushback at the bad office? And folks, please. I, I, By the way, uh, Mark and I worked it out. No problem. <laughs> I just like running, you know, coming down on him. Please, and he's a great guy. If you have questions, not only about the Teen Titans, but again, you know Mark's bibliography or Mark's bibliography. Excuse me. Uh, I, I really do encourage you because this is for you. So really, I mean, I have questions, but I'm happy to let you guys ask questions as well. But if you would, go up to the, go, yeah, approach the mic. While you're doing that, let me ask very quickly yeah. about uh, was there pushback for uh, Robin becoming Nightwing from the bad office and that kind of radical change in Dick Grayson? I know we had been aging uh, Dick Grayson for a while. We removed him from Batman. Uh, we We... In order for the Titans to be on their own, they had to act like adults. They had to, and if they had a leader, it, uh, he had to be intelligent, he had to be smart, he had to be everything that a real adult leader would be. So Nightwing, Dick Grayson was already 19 to 20 in my mind. Um, at that point, uh, and the Titans were selling phenomenally well, and. Uh, it was hard, frankly, keeping him in those stupid green pants, uh, green shorts, shorts yeah. <laughs> uh, which was the stupidest thing in the world. You know, it made sense when Robin was nine. Yeah. Uh, it did not make sense when he was 19. <laughs> so uh, at that particular point, uh, Denny O'Neill, who was the editor of the Batman book, uh, uh, asked for Robin back, and they wanted to make him young. And fortunately, the Titans sold very, very well. And I was able to say, no, I want, I want Dick Grayson. It would make sense for what we were doing, the splitting apart of, uh, of Batman and Robin totally, for Dick Grayson to go off and become somebody else. Why don't you create a new Robin? You could have Robin. I don't care about Robin. You, uh, you create a new Robin, and that, frankly, will bring attention to the Batman book and the whole franchise, and they loved that idea, and they went off and created their character, and I was able to have Robin, or Knight, Dick Grayson, graduate to becoming his own hero, which was the first time that ever happened in comics, where the, uh, where the kid partner became the, uh, an adult hero on their own. And it was a wonderful thing, and of course then, uh, that was Jason Todd that originally replaced Dick yeah. Grayson, and then you came up with a, a better uh, Robin and, and Tim Drake a well, little bit later. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, let's let's go to the, the people with questions. Miss, please. Hey, so I've been pretty new to comic books themselves. I've watched the cartoon, but actually reading the books is new. And Crisis on Infinite Earths is one of the first comics you, I've read. You're going to have to speak a little bit uh, louder because my hearing sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Crisis on Infinite Earths is one of the first um, comic books that, um, that I read. And I finished it just a couple months ago. And it just it blew my mind. It was so big and so huge and vast that I spent most of the book with my jaw just hanging down and I you know I cried a few times. It was just it was so big and it was just an incredible experience reading it. So I'm curious, um, what led you to write a story that huge? I mean it's it's infinite. Um, and what gave you the your guts to think that yeah, you spoiler alert. You can kill off two pretty major characters. Like, that was a pretty I, 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 I don't think 30 years later it's a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is a time limit for that. Um, I had, uh, because I, uh, I suggested the crisis uh, concept in 1981, uh, right after I got to DC, wow. um, and I was working on the Green Lantern book, and it says it right on the uh, in, in that first uh, issue. And somebody wrote about DC continuity, and I said we should think about it at some point, which of course made, forced me to think about it. And um, I had some time to do it while we also hired a researcher to read all the DC comics. Uh, ultimately. We didn't use any of it in Crisis, but we used it in Who's Who, so it paid off. Um, we had him uh, read and note, uh, annotate every single issue of every single DC comic ever. Um, uh, it's a job, trust me. If you try to read those 1940s stories, uh, <laughs> reading four of them in a row is a lot. Um, I had some, so I had some time, and then when they said, "Why we need to get this out, I said, you know, vamping for time uh, because I wanted to make sure the story worked. I said, you realize that in two years is DC's 50th anniversary. 
why don't we make this for that and make it a real special thing as DC heralds in the next 50 years? And that they loved. And that gave me some time to actually slowly and carefully plot the book. That's a structural nightmare. Uh, it had something like 500 characters in it and so many plots, uh, so many plot points. If you tried to do that the first time, you'd miss everything. You'd screw up horribly. You just couldn't do it. So I had a lot of time to keep changing things, fixing things, making sure it all worked. And because I had the time, we were able to do a book, I think, that is pretty much bulletproof in terms of mistakes. I don't think there are any. Maybe there is, but I don't know. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud of it. I, I think it's still one of the strongest ones that, uh, that have ever been done because I had the time to do it in. Um, as far as killing off the two spoiler alert characters, if you don't know too bad, I'm going to say it, Supergirl and Flash. Uh, Supergirl was my suggestion that was in my original notes. And amazingly, DC said yes. I honestly thought because the Supergirl movie had not yet come out that they would never let me do that. But my feeling, frankly, was, and if you like the Supergirl of that time period, I'm sorry, but nobody bought that book. <laughs> Nobody bought Supergirl back sure. then. Is all the goodwill of Super Supergirl was by people remembering how she was when they were nine, when she first came and she was sort of cute. But by the but by 1985, nobody cared. I figured we'd create another Supergirl down the line, but we needed to make Superman the sole surviving uh, um, hero from Krypton, the sole surviving person from Krypton, because we had to tell the readers, we had to show primarily the Marvel readers that DC was willing to make big changes. As far as Flash, uh, that was one that the company asked me uh, to, uh, to, to get rid of. And so I did that, and it took me six issues. I kept trying to fight it. We kept throwing them in as a little ghost, anything to delay it. But finally, uh, they said, no, it has to be. So uh, I scheduled it for the issue right after Supergirl, figuring nobody would think we'd do one-two punch. Um, and I think that really helped the Crisis series, quite frankly, because uh, it told all the readers out there that um, DC was willing to try things that they had never tried before. Hard to believe uh, today, with his own television series, that much like Supergirl, the Flash book was in incredibly low sales as well. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they did that trial of the Flash story, and no one was reading it. I mean, no, it, it was it, selling. Well, I think it went on for like thirty-seven years. <laughs> that story. <Yeah. laughs> Sean. Uh, three gentlemen in my life have had a profound effect on me: Ray Harryhausen, Boris J. Ackerman, and yourself. I grew up as a kid of the seventies, so I have two questions. Hopefully, one is simple. One is taking a Pandora's box. A, the creation of Blake. I grew up on films like Superfly, all the Jim Brown stuff, um, and considering that character came out, was that a consideration of, of yours or the company's as far as getting a demographic? It was also the age of the Black Panthers. Um, and then uh, a more esoteric question is, you've done so much work and your output is so constant and, 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 and so assured that I would like to hear you talk about maybe, um, people ask about how do I get into the industry? Well, I would like to ask you about the, uh, the work ethic and putting time in the chair. And because you've written so much that I know that some of those times you probably weren't in the greatest of places, and sometimes you were probably in Barbados. So how do you keep okay, I did the work I actually did not hear the first part of the question. It was about Blade, and yeah. coming out at the time of the black exploitation films, the inspiration for Blade, was that connected in terms of what was going on in cinema? It, it's hard to hear, but I got the question. I'm sorry, it's my hearing, so it reverbs badly. Um, I grew up in New York City. Uh, I went to a specialized high school, uh, high school of art and design, uh, intended to be an artist. Most people, I don't know if it's the same here, certainly in New York, if you, when you went to high school, you'd go to high school in your area, and everybody attending that high school was pretty much the people who lived within a mile of the school. Sure. So we were all the same type. 
okay? Uh, whatever that type is, because you li- you were went to a high school with your neighbors. Sure. Um, high School of Art and Design was in Manhattan. You took a test to get in, and they... It was, it, it, all you had to have was a great por- art portfolio, as well as your educational stuff, but primarily a, a great art portfolio, which meant anybody in New York City could try to get in. So the school, the high school, was filled with every ethnic type, everybody, all they had in common was some sort of art talent. And what that did was expose you to everybody. And when you're exposed to everybody, you realize everybody's the same. And you realize that there shouldn't be a problem having a black character. Um, My partner and I at the time, writing partner and I at the time, tried to submit a black character to the Teen Titans. And part of it, it actually got drawn, but then was never used because it was a... well, I'm not even sure why, but because um, I've heard so many stories. At any rate, we really wanted that character to go through, and I swore to myself that the next character I created would be black and would get through, because I felt, why isn't there? I mean, Marvel already had the Black Panther, and and uh, one um, Gabe in um, Sergeant Fury. Uh, why shouldn't other companies and why shouldn't other books have it? And when I did Blade, uh, nobody even raised uh, a, a finger. Uh, two years had passed since the Titans thing, and I was able to do Blade as a black character. I was able to have a lot of characters of different ethnic groups in it. It's because, as I say, I never saw any reason why not. New York City was a major melting pot of everybody, and I, I lived right there because of uh, high school. So, so, ghettos. so the fact that there were also at the same time um, all the uh, uh, black exploitation films or whatever you want to call them, I, I don't think that they actually were, but uh, uh, certainly probably gave people the idea that well, those movies are doing well, maybe um, a comic would do well as, uh, as well. But I also think it's the fact that everybody was about the same age at that point, all of us, and we all went, yeah, we're going to do this. Why aren't we going to do this? So that's why. That's excellent. And then real quick, um, your work ethic, is there a, you know, can you explain in terms of when, for other people, it might be tough to write, how you plow through? And uh... Uh, I consider myself a structural writer. So if you like my stuff, if you liked all of that stuff, it's because I work out the structure uh, endlessly until I'm happy with it so that each scene flows correctly into the next or whatever. And that helped me even at times when my writing wasn't very strong, when I was going through writer's blocks or whatever. The structure was there. The writing may not have been inspired, but the structure was always there. Cool. Please. Kind of a, this, this is kind of a, a follow-up to that. From your comics, from, from, from the idea of Blade at the beginning to Wesley Science interpretation, how, what were the surprising aspects for you that you might, that you didn't think of that he actually accomplished from what? The changes in Blade from your interpretation to Wesley Snipes, were there things that others contributed to Blade that surprised you or you were happy about? I make make it a practice, and I've always said this since the days of Dracula, that I never read any characters that I created after I leave it. Man, Um, so you haven't read Spider-Man since you left Spider-Man. I didn't create Spider-Man. Oh, excuse me. All right, that's true. Um, (laughs) So... My reasoning for that is I never asked the previous people what, they, what I should do. I never asked the previous people if they liked what I did. As much as I respected them, I didn't care for their an- I didn't care to hear their answers. It's my belief that I should do what I believe in. And if I'm doing a copy of somebody else, it's not going to be as good as uh, if, if I do what I truly believe in. Therefore, I will not let the next person in a book that I don't own and can't really control anyway once I'm off it come to me or want to or look at and say they got it wrong. 
I know every character's, if I created them, I know their speech patterns. I know how they're going to react. I know how they're going to think. I know how all this stuff is going to work. Whether you like the stories or not, I know those characters inside and out. Nobody can get into my head. Therefore, the, the best, Alan Moore at his very best could not do a, a, a Teen Titans story that I, would, that I could say would sound like a Teen Titans story to me. It may be a thousand percent better than what I did, but it wouldn't be mine. So I just don't look at it. It's unfair for me to criticize somebody else, and it's also unfair for, for them to want, and they always do, ask me what I think of their work. By simply saying, I'm sorry, I've never read it, I make it a practice, they all understand it. Interesting. I want to, you know, if people haven't read the novelization that Marv wrote of Crisis on Infinite Earths, I encourage you to because I think it gave you an opportunity to get inside of a lot of characters' heads yeah, well, in a way that the comic couldn't. The novelization was really fun to write because I decided I wasn't going to novelize Crisis. I told the story of Barry Allen. It's all narrated by Barry. And when you think about him in the crisis, he's pretty much a captive the entire time, so you don't get any real story about him. But I'm telling his story from the beginning to end. All the scenes are there, but it's told from a completely different viewpoint. How did you handle, I know last summer you did the Suicide Squad right. novel. And, yeah. and I, as I understand it, there's a lot more insight to what was going on in the Joker's mind in the story than in, on the film. Um, yeah, there were more Joker scenes. Not all of them made it into the book because uh, I finished the book in January of that year. And in May, they called me to make some revisions because of changes in the uh, screenplay. Sometimes the original material stayed even though it wasn't in the movie anymore. And sometimes it didn't. Now, before this gets mis misconstrued or something, every single movie made goes through reshoots every movie and what happens is you you uh, have a finished film you air it and then only when it's all completed can you tell if it all works and that's when they start making changes and all of them did so there's nothing surprising that uh, Suicide Squad did, uh, did exactly the same as um, The Force Awakens which they talk about major changes in that Everything works, everything goes through that same process. And so there's a lot more about the Joker and Holly in my version, and there was even more in the first version, but the movie changed somewhat, and all the stuff that I kept hearing, they put in humor or something. No, there's, they didn't put in any more humor. They were cleaning up scenes okay. and moving the, order of the, moving the order of the scenes somewhat. Uh, Okay. Okay. Sure. Right. Uh, stepping back to Drew's contract briefly, back at the time, was there any controversy or concern or blowback in regards to the relationship between Terra and Vesco, or did that only come later and more sensitive client? Yeah. Um, interestingly, there wasn't any comment. I don't recall getting a single letter on the Deathstro Terra uh, relationship. I mean, looking back at it now, I can't believe I wrote it that way, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Uh, but no, there was absolutely no, uh, nothing there to, nobody complained. I mean, the fact that he's an adult and she was 15, uh, but I think the day she walked out wearing the negligee and smoking a cigarette, sort of, like, people may have said, maybe she's actually 18 or 20 or something, I don't know. No, she was 15. Um, <laughs> But no, there were no comments on it at the time. Yeah. Well, and you know, that's the thing. So, social mores change. I mean, Nabokov and Lolita was 20 years before you did that story, and that's, that's another underage story. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it, people can judge things now. That's fine. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, I can see that nobody blinked in 1985. Yeah. Or, pardon me, 19. And we didn't think about it for a second. We just felt that was the correct relationship for those two characters. Yes? So you work with um, George Perez on multiple books like Christ on the Earth and um, Teen Titans. How has George Perez, um, has he changed the way you write or the way you work with other artists? Well, George and I, uh, let me backtrack first. Gene Colan and I were phenomenal partners uh, working on Tim and Dracula, but Gene took my plots 
very complete, very detailed plots, and just drew them unbelievably beautifully. George and I didn't work that way. Uh, George and I were true partners. The first couple of issues, first maybe seven issues of Titans, I presented a full plot to him the same way I did to everybody else, because we had only worked a couple of times at most at Marvel. But right from the beginning, because I knew his work from Marvel, I was his editor uh, on top of a writing partner in some things, um, I knew he knew storytelling, I knew he knew character, I knew he knew plot. So he was always free to make changes in what I did. Just let me know what they are um, and why he did it so that I could adjust my copy to it. Within a very short time, we were co-plotting the material. I'd come in, he lived in the same place five blocks away from me. We'd get together at a diner and I, had the, I would have the idea for the story you know, and maybe a couple of big scenes in it. But then, together, we would co-plot it uh, and make sure it worked both visually and uh, story-wise. So the book could not... When George left five years later, by the way, the longest run he had ever been on any single title, and we're still good friends. Um, we see each other at a lot of conventions, which is great. Um, if anybody... Nobody... As I said before, nobody could get into my head to hear how characters speak. They have to do it their way. Nobody could truly get into the combined me and George on what who Cyborg was or who Raven was or any. Because we knew those characters intimately, and those characters reflected both of us. So George's work was more than just being an artist on the book. He was definitely the co-plotter of the book and was credited as such and paid as such. Very cool. Yeah. Sir? So, uh, the evolution of the name Nightwing, and how did that come about? I know that it was in Superman comics yeah. and stuff like that. How did you get there and where did any of the names from? Okay, I fought Nightwing like you could not believe, because uh, of Nightwing and Flamebird. Uh, the Superman characters. Uh, the problem was, we knew what we were doing, and for about three, four, five months, while we were plotting the story that would lead up to it, could not come up with a good name. <laughs> could not even come close, and the colorist on the book, Tony Tolan, uh, uh, the colorist's husband on the book, I think it was Adrian Tolan who, uh, who was the colorist, kept saying, why don't you just do Nightwing? And I said, because Superman has two characters, has a Nightwing character. The day it had to go to the letterer and had to be done, I just had no other idea, and then went, oh damn, okay, Nightwing fits, we're turning him into not quite Batman, not quite Superman character and all of that, and we just went with it because <laughs> it was the best name, and no one could come up with a better one. So we went with it, and uh, fortunately, it seems to have stuck. <laughs> In hindsight, did anything ever come to you later and said, ah, oh, if only we had said no, this? No, it was, okay. it was frankly the absolute perfect name, sure. but I was fighting it only because of the other character. Oh, yeah. You know, not because it was a bad name, but because I just didn't want to take a Superman character. But I solved that in the writing by having him say the night part came from Batman, the Nightwing part came from Superman. He, he allowed the concept that Superman knew, knew Nightwing. So, That's awesome. You know, if, if you can't make it work on your own, you have to fudge an explanation, and that worked. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> Sir. Yes. Do you have any brief words of advice for aspiring comic writers? Uh, yeah, come to my panel tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing a writing panel. Uh, do not think of yourself as a comic book writer. Think of yourself as a writer who's going to do comic books, because if you think of yourself as a comic book writer, you're going to repeat everything that other comic book people have done, and your stuff will not be original. If you come, think of yourself as a writer who you may be doing exclusively comics, I don't know, uh, though nobody should, by the way. Uh, nobody should do exclusively any one thing. Um, because every time you do something different, it, it just gives you more knowledge of other forms. Okay, I write video games, I write animation, I write books, I write comics. 
uh, stuff like that. Each one helps me with the other. So the thing is, work to become an inv a, a unique writer in your voice to tell a story that you care about. Yes? I'm a huge Raven fan. I was wondering where your inspiration I can't hear you. I'm a huge Raven fan. I was wondering where your inspiration for Raven came from. The inspiration for Raven. Which, by the way, if you, if you don't know, Marv just wrapped up a, a new miniseries I'm with Raven. A miniseries, yeah. Uh, okay, first, I wanted the exact opposite of every character. She was a pacifist. Um, the this is going to go into the writing thing, and I actually talk about this at the writing panel on uh, my writing panel. But I'll do a quick version of it. I created uh, these triangles in writing uh, the, in creating the Teen Titans for the girls. Wonder Girl was at the top of the triangle because she was the old character. Wonder Girl is from a sect of people uh, with a unique, um, they're like a coven in a sense, uh, but a, spe a specific sect of people who were very religious in the terms of the Amazons, but they were also warriors, okay? So the sect part, the strange grouping became Raven. The Amazon part, the warrior part became Starfire. Uh, Starfire um, uh, was all emotion. Raven was no emotion. So each character reflected, had reflected the other character and also told their own story. So it was very important to me to create a family. I wasn't doing a group book. I wasn't doing the Justice League of the Avengers. It was important they have reasons to stay together, but differences that would keep them constantly at odds with each other at the same time. But primarily, I wanted them to be able to come together. So that, the idea of the daughter of Satan, essentially, um, uh, all of that stuff came from just developing her slowly and finding all the, all the important parts. If Starfire, uh, rather Wonder Girl was the daughter of the gods, Raven was going to be the anti, a daughter of the anti-god. Again, keeping them all together. So there's a lot more involved with it, trust me, but uh, it, it spent a long time to do that. Also, I like the idea of an empath. I had created one in Werewolf by Night at Marvel um, and uh, never got a chance to explore the character as I wanted. And so I decided to take that aspect, the empath aspect, and move it into uh, Raven but do it in a completely different fashion uh, than I had even started with the other. Okay? The comparing the two uh, relationships, Raven and Wally West and Starfire and Dick Grayson, very interesting relationships. Sir? Yeah, because Raven actually manipulated Wally West. Yeah. Uh, she, forced. she forced her emotions on him to make him do things that she needed. So, yeah. Pretty cool. Sir. Sure. Um, you know, just kind of a general question, if I may, is um, where, do you, where would you draw like inspirations for all your different plot lines and stuff? For where, where do inspirations I for plot lines? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no writer will. T no writer has any idea. It. You know, we do what we do because that seems to work in our heads. I'm a writer because I enjoy coming up with stories, and if I didn't come up with stories. I wouldn't be a writer. So the fact that I do, I don't know where that comes from. I, I don't think any of us want to analyze that because then we'd be looking for it. You know, uh, we just go with the flow. I have no idea where any of the stories come from. Yeah. Sure. I'm hoping to answer this question. I remember reading an interview several years ago where you were talking about the plotting of Crisis on Infinite Earths number eight and about how to carry on sacrifice of himself, and you indicated that you put in some sort of plot device that would have left Oh, uh, stop. <laughs> I got so, so tired of telling that. Boy, I am sorry. It's uh, what my alternative uh, way of getting Flash out of it, because I, as I said, it wasn't my idea to kill him. Uh, it's on my website under question and answers, smallforefront.com. I will never talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a 
27 years later, also, by the way, it helps, has no relevance to anything. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm wondering what you think of Teen Titans Go, the cartoon show? Yeah, the new one. The new one? Uh, it's actually three years old now. First, I love <laughs> the original Teen Titans cartoon show. I wrote some episodes of it. I, I liked it an awful lot. When I first saw Teen Titans Go, I, I, I thought it was for a much younger audience, like pre-born. <laughs> uh, I thought it was a perfect uh, show for fetuses. Um, but then what happened was I was cleaning the house and Cartoon Network uh, insisted upon putting it on 47 hours a day. And it was on the whole day constantly while I'm doing stuff and I, every so often I, I'm staring at it and starting to laugh and not laughing at it but laughing with it and I grew to love it because it's the funniest, silliest, uh, dumbest, <laughs> best comedy that's I think on TV. It's hysterical and you know, yeah, it, Unlike the, car, uh, unlike the original Two Times cartoon show, I couldn't even dream of writing this one. I don't know, you know, I don't know what drugs they're taking. Or, <laughs> it is hysterical. I love it. I really do love it. Uh, so if you put that on Twitter, make sure you say, I do love it, because I actually do. It, it's hysterical. Um, I, I have no idea how one writes that. Sir. Sure. Yes. Um, I watched your video on YouTube and I heard there's a new Teen Titans comic that brought back Wally West and they're all grown ups. I, uh, Wally West and the new Teen Titans, I have no idea. I don't read this book anymore um, because they're using all my characters, so I, I just avoid it. I can um, confirm that. It's a, good, it's a good series. And it's nice to have Wally West back. Before we go back to, and miss, no, if you ask your question, then I'll ask another question. Uh, so it's always fascinating to hear what writers like to read. So of, you know, your top books that you go back to repeatedly, you like to read. Do you have books that you go back to repeatedly and reread? Of old books that you've enjoyed uh, anything? Of my stuff? The stuff you like, no, no, stuff that you like to read as, as just a reader yourself, what uh, you like to read. No. Uh... I, 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 I don't have the time to go back to read my old, uh, any of the old stuff. I like to, when I read, I read something I hadn't read before. Okay. Um, when I have to, in comics, when I have to do a story that uses continuity, I do have to go back because I can't remember it all, even my own stuff, okay. uh, let alone somebody else's. So I will go back for that. But that's for work. That's not for um, anything else. I find it very hard to read my old stuff. Okay. Uh, because my style keeps evolving, I hope. And, um, you know, I, I look back at it and just think, too much dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask real fast because yeah. your characterization of Lex Luthor changed the character dramatically in the 80s. Thank you. I can't, absolutely, man. And, and it was always interesting to read that when Byrne came up with Man of Steel, they always made sure that there was a special credit for your yeah. Interpretation, yeah, what you brought as Luther. I can't help but ask in uh, the current environment, he had a different role back in the 80s, but there was an obvious resemblance to our current president. Again, as a, as a industrialist, in fact, they even took the Art of the Deal cover and made a different comic with what, again, what started with your you know, thoughts of, of Luther, the mad scientist, then Luther the industrialist. What's the question, though? Well, I just wondered, what, was Trump on your mind when you were give, coming up with this new interpretation of Luther, or no? No, I like Luther. <laughs> Titans, which I totally forgot because I forget everything um, that some fan sent to me uh, on Facebook. Um, a panel from 1980 something where Gar Logan, Changeling, Beast Boy, whatever you feel like calling him, um, <laughs> goes into his dad, who's the sixth richest man in the world, uh, and his father is angry. And Gar's comment is something to the effect of, "What's bothering you? You want me to jump? You want me to tramp, tramp on Donald Trump or something?" <laughs> this was in the early '80s. Trump was very well known in New York. Yeah. 
uh, and he was on every television show in New York. Yeah. And I think the feelings that I have on him now are pretty much the same as I had in the 80s and wish Gar had trampled him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if anyone doesn't believe it. I would. I would if he had any idea. But um, I actually, I want to go back to what this uh, young man asked you, where you took your plot lines from. I'm a writer, I'm a musician, though, uh, by and large, and I believe in something called the cosmic radio. Um, so instead of, like, where do you come up with your plot lines, have you ever woken up with, like, it's already done? Like, when the id and the subconscious does all the work for you, because you're such a structuralist and so good with that, that you ever just went and somebody's fully formed, like, you know, you got to dinner and boom. Yeah, I, I, I am a firm believer that your brain is working when you're not aware of it. And I say that because in my, in, in my writing life, twice within seconds, um, no, two different times, characters came to me full blown which, which with, every, uh, with every, with every, facet of their character, their look, their origin, their history, everything. The first was Blade, the second was Deathstroke. And awesome. I knew everything about both of those characters in one second without ever intending to create them, without thinking about them or anything else. So I do believe that the head works like that. I also have many, many stories where it's not working, structurally it's not working, and suddenly I realized what I needed to do all along was to turn it 180 degrees, and suddenly the plot works. I had all the elements, they were in the wrong order, and once you turn them around, everything could work correctly. So yeah, I do believe that the, uh, you, you are thinking about things, and you just don't know it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get these last two in real fast, so quick questions, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Make them as quick as you can, and he'll be as quick with his answers, please. Okay. Um, I know as a writer, you probably don't have, like, a favorite character, but was there any character you found particularly interesting to write for? Interesting to write for? Uh, so many of them. I really found Dracula interesting. I found Spider-Man phenomenal. Superman I love because everyone says they can't write it, and I love writing the character. <laughs> um, uh, tons of them. Raven, Starfire... Uh, cyborg. Uh, I've done so many. Yeah, That's just a, a lot of them. That's a good list, sir. Last question, real fast. What did you do when you got writer's block? What did you do when you got writer's block? When you're at a certain level, you have you have um, professionalism. You know how to compose a story is so that the story's all there. It's just that it's not inspired. Uh, the dialogue doesn't sparkle, maybe the plot is mundane. I still wrote through it, uh, it's just that it wasn't very special. So you just, uh, my belief is always you do not let yourself be defeated, you just keep pushing at it and eventually you push through. And if you give up, you're, you're pretty much admitting you're not going to be able to do it anymore. So you just keep doing it and hope that it switches. Otherwise, you know, there are bread lines out there. <laughs> <laughs> what time is your writer's panel tomorrow? Um, oh, four or five, something like that. Okay, it's look on the schedule. schedule. So you could always look at Excellent. It. Thank I'm you very table much. table 701, something like that. It's the 700 aisle. On this side, I'll be there in 10 minutes if you want to come by and ask anything else. I have scripts, I have posters. Uh, who could ask for anything more? There you go. Great conversation, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> Marv Wolfman, live from Fanex in Salt Lake City. It was a great opportunity, and I was uh, pleased to be able to have that uh, great conversation and give it to you today on Word Balloon. There's one more panel from Fanex coming up uh, in our next episode. Marty Pasco is back, and uh, happy to do a live conversation with Marty uh, at Fan X about Batman, the animated series. Marty uh, was not only one of the main story editors on the show, uh, but also uh, co wrote Batman, Mask of the Phantasm, that incredible animated film that uh, was so good. They even decided, instead of just uh, throwing it on VHS immediately, again, pre DVDs, uh, this also went uh, into the theaters. 
And uh, I remember seeing it in the movie theater and was just so blown away at uh, what a lush production it was, at least from my standpoint. You'll hear Marty's thoughts on it and also what uh, Warner Brothers thought of the series, what Fox thought about the series. Uh, A great conversation. Can't wait to share it with you on the next episode of Word Balloon. Word Balloon was uh, brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. Great deals are happening now at InStock Trades. Uh, Man, I want to throw some of this stuff out at you. Uh, Of course, uh, because of the Iron Fist series being out, Marvel has put out a new collection of Iron Fist stories um, from uh, people like uh, Sam Keith uh, doing the art uh, chores. Uh, This is collecting uh, uh, Spider-Man 41 through 43 Iron Fist stories that were in Marvel's weekly book, Marvel Comics Presents, in 88. Uh, and uh, material from the Namor Annual, number three. Interesting. I don't remember Namor and Iron Fist uh, fighting. I might have to pick this up. 42% off. It's $20.29. Uh, you can check out, remember Night Raven? I certainly do. From Marvel UK. Uh, David Lloyd uh, did the cover. Uh, I don't know who's uh, on the interiors here as far as uh, this work. But uh, Night Raven, Ra- uh, Raven was a very interesting Marvel UK character. 42% off for this collection. Uh, it is... Uh, $20.29, same price. How about that? Uh, you can get uh, The Daredevil by Mark uh, Wade Omnibus, Mark Wade and Chris Somney, and Paulo Rivera, 42% off. It's just $58. Um, keep looking here. What else have we got? Batman by Brian K. Vaughn. Wow, that's an interesting collection. Scott McDaniel, uh, Scott McDaniel among the artists that are represented in this collection, 45% off, just uh, $9.34. Uh, East West, there we go. Uh, year two of the apocalypse. Jonathan Hickman, Nick Dragata, tremendous series. God, it's been far too long since I've had Hickman on or Dragata for that matter. 50% off, $24.99. Uh, just a few of the great books that are available at InStockTrades.com. Check it out for yourself. As I said earlier, great deals, great prices. InStockTrades.com. That also could be said for our other sponsor today, ECC Frames. Dot com, uh, great guys uh, who are uh, making custom framing for your original art, action figures, lobby cards, uh, uh, gold albums, uh, or albums you want to keep pristine. Uh, do it in a in a nice presentation that not only uh, will display your work but also keep it safe with uh, ultraviolet protective uh, acrylic and uh, very quality Italian wood uh, for the framing. Do yourself a favor, go to eccframes.com. Thanks again for listening. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. As always, I appreciate your support. Uh, If you like Word Balloon and want to uh, support the show, do it via Patreon, uh, wordballoon.com slash, uh, let's see. Patreon.com slash wordballoon is the place to go. Thank you for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Uh, questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Follow me on Twitter at John Word Balloon and uh, on Facebook under my name, John Suntress, and the Word Balloon Network. Uh, thank you very much. As always, it's, uh, it's appreciated your attention and support. And I look forward to talking to you in just a few days. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2017.